I'm not going to bring an Easter or <laughs> resurrection message. Um, I, I, I just the reason I don't want to is because it's been concerning me greatly that Jesus Christ paid an awesome price for us mm. on the cross. And the, what you said, Anne, was just bang on. The Father gave his everything for us. Mm. And in general, the church is not living in that place. Yeah. And yesterday it made me cry when I started to think about it. I thought, he's given so much to us, and yet we're only scratching the surface because the bottom line is we're too spiritually lazy. We're too lazy to press in yeah. to him. That's, that's really what it comes down yeah. to. And, uh, of course, some scriptures started to flood to me, you know, like the story of the virgins, the story of the man with the talents, and he said to the one with the one, you wicked servant. Yeah, thank you. And basically the guy was lazy. He didn't want to use what God had given him. And, and so that's why I can't bring a resurrection message, and I know that's what most churches do at this time of year. Mm. I, I want to bring what the Holy Spirit laid on my heart, and it is quite deep. And I just hope that you can swallow it and take it home and chew it over. Because you'll be chewing for a while. It's The message today is idolatry is destroying the church. Mm. Idolatry is destroying the church. And um, we don't hear a lot preached about idolatry in the church, do we? Mm. Proverbs 16 verse 25 says, There is a way that appears right, but in the end it leads to death. Father God, I pray that you mm. would anoint my tongue to bring the words that you would have me say today. Mm. Holy Spirit, I ask you to stir our hearts, you speak to us, examine each one of us this day, mm. that we may become more like you because you paid an awesome price for us, Jesus. You gave your everything, not so we could play church, not so we could just go through religious practice, but so we could live out th those amazing promises that you gave to us. Mm. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to verse 30, full of promises, full of your goodness, full of your heart for your creation, your love for your creation, that you wanted mm. us to live way above where we're living. And Father, so I just pray you'll stir us today. Help us to examine ourselves yes. so we can become more like you. You know, we are the first nation in the world, New Zealand, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thing because you come from a different country, Mike and Maggie and Luke. We're the first nation in the world that celebrates this resurrection of the Saviour in the world. And two of the great prophecies that were given to this nation, one was by Smith Wigglesworth, I believe, another was... And you may know the name of the man. He was a Spanish sailor, I think. Oh, yeah. Back in the 1700s, yeah. I think. Both of them gave very similar prophecies saying that this great revival is going to come out of the Southland down here yeah. and flood through Australia and into the rest of the world. Yeah. I believe that. The reason I believe it is this. The sun always rises in the east first. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> so... You know, the sun always rises in the east. I believe the Son of God is going to rise down here first. I really do. But there's a problem with this. The church is waiting for this great revival to happen. I've heard so many different stories from different people in different churches, how it's going to look. You know, there's different ideas what it's going to look like. And as you know, I, you know I'm passionate about revival. I've been talking about it for two years now. But I'm also passionate to find out what God's heart for revival is mm -hmm. and what revival really means. You know, the church is waiting for this great revival, this great harvest of souls. What form is this revival going to take? And that's the question, because you've probably heard lots of things. God's going to come down and like, woof, and it's all going to happen. I don't believe that for a minute. The, you know, I believe that the form this revival is going to take is this. This is really the question we need to ask, is what is biblical revival? Because according to... Ecclesiastes is nothing new under the sun, so it means that God is not going to do something new. He's going to do something that he's already done. He's going to draw from his great wealth that's in the Bible. The problem is, it's all in the Bible, but a lot of us can't see it. We've got a veil on. Mm. That's what I found the last two years. You know, I can read something 50 times and on the 51st time I go, yeah. huh? 
I haven't read that before. I don't know about you. Have you been like that? And you say, where did that come from? You've read it. You've heard it many times. But all of a sudden, it's like it's illuminated. Everything is in the Word already. It's just that there is a veil. And the thing is, God is wanting to lift that veil off us. What form is this revival going to take? Revival is always when fallen man turns back to God with a renewed hunger. That's what revival basically is, and a passion for him. And after all, the word revive means to restore back from almost the death. If, if I revive an animal or a plant or whatever, what I'm doing is taking that thing that is almost depleted of its life and bringing it back to its state that it's meant to be. That's what revival is. So that's what God wants to do for the church. For that to happen, changes also have to happen in the church. We need an intervention of God. Or do we? My belief is that intervention has already happened a long time ago. I believe it's already happened a long time ago. And I believe, I, I believe it's happened in the form of a scripture that I'm going to give you soon. See, God never builds on a faulty foundation. Never. But he brings our attention to, to that which needs to be changed. Calamities, hardship, war, famine is the, is some of the things God uses to, to get man's, you know that as well as I do, especially if you understand our covenant, God will use these things to get man's attention, why? To draw them back to him again. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? Yeah. God is yeah. God uses those things. So why? To get his people's attention. Judgment begins, the Bible says, in the house of the Lord. Now we quote that out of the book of Peter, because Peter quoted it, word verbatim, word for word, for time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. The verse doesn't come from Peter, by the way, it comes from Ezekiel. Peter is quoting out of the book of Ezekiel. And and for all of the judgment sorry, all of the judgments of God, the most severe, I believe, and I think this is scripturally sound, the most severe of all God's judgments is when he withdraws his word from his people. That is the most severe of all of God's judgments. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Amos said in chapter 8, verse 11, he, he says that, this is, I'll, I'll read it in a minute, he says that there's a famine coming upon the land. Now, we all know that was relating back to before Christ that time, but prophecy <laughs> often has multiple meanings. It doesn't just mean it's for that season and, and that time. And I believe that what we're seeing in the church is the judgment of God of a famine in the land. Now, now, how does this play out? I'm going to show you from Scripture what this actually means. The day has come, the, the verse says, says the Lord, when I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but a famine of hearing my word. So in other words, God is not withholding his word, but what he's doing is something different. See, the famine is not that God ceases to speak, that, that, but it is that man ceases to hear. God doesn't stop giving his word. The problem is man is not hearing the word of the Lord. Now this has been going on a long time, and you're going to see this in a minute. Man is no longer hearing the word of the Lord. The famine is not that God ceases to speak, that man ceases to hear. Man no longer understands or has revelation of God's truths. Now think back, because some of you are older than me over your lifetime. Think back to those that you've gone to, that I've gone to, to seek counsel, to seek wisdom. Those who have got PhDs or masters or whatever behind their name. Those who we've admonished and put up here. Those who have big churches, for example. Think of those people today in light of what I'm saying. See, the second thing is, what is the sign of a famine? How do we know if we're in a famine right now? Amos 8, verse 11 to verse 13. If... Has anyone got their Bible open on that or not? If you could read it to me. Amos 8, verse 11 to verse 13. Is that, Behold, the days are coming. Yeah. When Adonai the Lord, with Adonai the Lord, that I shall send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they will wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. Mm. And they will run to and fro. To seek the word of the Lord mm. and will not find it. See, the, the, the sign is man has substituted the Creator speaking to him for man to speak to him. That's the sign that there's a famine. Mm. 
when man substitutes the Creator speaking directly to him and starts to try and hear through another man. There's nothing wrong with listening to a teacher or a preacher. We should do that. That yeah. God placed those gifts in the church. The problem is when we take that yeah. and we live our life by it. Yeah. And this is where this is where we've all made mistakes, yeah. if we were honest. We've followed man's teachings mm -hmm. without examining the truths of those teachings. So it's the sign the sign that the famine has come is when man substitutes the Creator speaking to him. You imagine God speaking directly to you. You substitute that for listening to what a man says, and then you follow that. Number three, the famine produces restlessness. Notice that that, that person is looking to and fro, looking for this knowledge, but they can't find it. That's what the Bible tells us there. See, notice in verse 12, the people are searching to and fro, it says, mm. for new revelation. But they can't find it. The Word of God becomes substituted for religious activity and programs. People go running here to listen to the speaker, and there's nothing wrong with hear what I'm saying. They here, and they run there, and they're trying to get new information, new knowledge, because the old stuff didn't work. They're hungry for God, but they're seeking the answers, and they can't find it. That's what he's saying here. Who is affected by the famine? Well, all of society. But in particular, notice what it says. I think it's verse 13. Look at verse 13. It's talking about the young people, the youth, our mm. children. They're the ones who are going to be affected most from this. Now, this is scary. Yeah. Because look at the use of the hour now. And, and, and forgive me for saying this, Luke, but most don't want to know God. Mm. Why? Because they've seen what God is in their family and they think, we don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. The ones that, that Amos says that is going to be most affected is the youth. Mm. What is the cause of the famine? It's always because of idolatry. The reason that God sends a famine is always, right throughout the Bible, always because of idolatry. Nothing else, idolatry. Serving the creature rather than the creator. Looking for experience more than looking for sound doctrine. And the church must come back to seeking the Lord through his word and allow the word to speak mm -hmm. to them. Oh, we've got mega churches that on the outward seem so great. Man would judge that as success. Numbers, whatever. But how many of those people in those mega churches are hearing directly from God themselves? Mm -hmm. That's idolatry. When all you do is you go to church and you say, we've got this great worship band and you worship God in that church, and you listen to the speaker, and you say, I've got it for the week, I'm good to go now for a week. That's not God. Mm. Mm. We've got to come back to this place where we're hearing from Him. Jesus said, I only do what I hear my Father say. Yes. Mm. If God is judging the church, and that's every individual when I talk about the church, then it means there is a reason why and it's this that I want to look at today. And idolatry is the reason. So I want to look into this. It's not. I'm sorry, it's going to take a little bit of time, but please bear with me. This is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. This is from the Holy Spirit, not from Martin. I didn't get this off the internet, this message. Or out of a book. Proverbs says, through knowledge, that's knowledge of God's word, the mm -hmm. just are delivered. This tells us the just or the believer can be bound. Because if you need deliverance, obviously you're bound to start with. Hmm? So that's what it tells us. So is the church currently judging her condition or does she believe she's all good with God? I think you know the answer to that. Mm. I think the church believes she's all good. Yeah. Ah, it's true. Yeah. Mm. 
deception has always veiled the church through history and 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 repetitive intervention from god has come through his prophets in the old covenant even in the new covenant god will will send a, a man an apostle or a prophet and, he, and he'll bring that person to try and shake that nation to try and shake that church to shake the belief system and they go we don't want to hear it look at Je jeremiah was at 40 years mike he stood outside the temple trying to get the attention of the people they didn't want to know we're all good everything's right yeah. but they're not hearing from god whereas one man is hearing from god and as we look around we see the evidence of people shackled with burdens you know this is true people with with sickness people with poverty people with addictions people with emotional torment spiritual bondage this is both in the church and out of the church that's true too this is an indictment. As we're taking that communion this morning, there's tears coming into my eyes because I thought, Jesus, you died for this stuff. Amen. And yet the church is full of it. Yeah. It's a contradiction to the work of the cross that we want to elevate today. It's a contradiction when we see half of the congregation uh, 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 shackled with, with addictions or whatever problems because the work of the cross is a finished perfect work. Yes. 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 So when our churches are like that, it means something drastically is wrong. It's not the people's fault. It's the one behind the pulpits. Amen. The leaders of the churches, it's their fault. Yes. Because they're not telling the people the truth to set Amen. them free. Amen. And yet we celebrate this risen Savior today. And people jump and yell and scream who died an agonizing death to break the same curses that people are still bound with. You know, only three years ago in my Christian walk, I really started to question this stuff. I really started to question this. I've gone through a life of just doing what I saw others do and hearing what I... It, and I started to question, like, Jesus, you died for this stuff. And it's still happening in my life. It's still happening in my friend's life. It's still happening in my family. Something doesn't add up. Either you're a liar or something is wrong here. And I know God is not a liar. The Bible said that any man should boast. Huh? So something is wrong. The very person that goes along to a church for help and cries out for help, in all honesty, has little success in being set free these days. Mm. Look, if we're going to be honest, like, like the prophets were in the Bible, we need to get hard on the stuff and get real and stop pulling punches. Mm. How many people are getting set free in the church? Very few. I'm not trying to condemn the church. It's time we wake up to truth mm -hmm. and we stand up for truth because once we align ourselves with truth, that's where the power of God is. That's where people can be set free. Mm. And our Christian title does not entitle us to live free from oppression, but an understanding and an application of God's spiritual laws. That's what will set us free. Every believer is a spiritual lawyer. You're a lawyer. I don't know if you realize that. You're a lawyer, brother Mike. You're a lawyer, sister Amy. Each one of you are lawyers in this room. You are far greater than any lawyer who serves in this country because you are serving the kingdom of God. You have been assigned as a lawyer to judge everything the Bible says. Mm -hmm. mm. Every believer is a spiritual lawyer whose job is to study and interpret the spiritual laws of God. Yes. and apply it. That's our job. A judge is only interested in one thing. What does the law say? Mm. I noticed when I was sitting recently in that hearing, I won't mention the brother's name, the judge is not interested in my emotion. He's interested in one thing. What does the law say? Mm. It does not matter. You say, but I didn't know. He doesn't care. He's interested in one thing. What does the law say? Mm -hmm. Let's apply the law here. And God is no different because he is the great judge of all mankind. And we're representatives of that court. You and me. That's an amazing thought. Think yes. about it. You're yes. a lawyer. Yes. So I want to look today how spiritual assignments sent against churches cripple them, making them spiritually bankrupt and ineffective. Under the Old Covenant, the nation of Israel is judged by God as a nation. Mm. So when one person does something wrong, the nation cha is charged for the crime. That's true. Read the Old Covenant. Under the New Covenant, the church, the church represents God. So under the Old Covenant, the nation of Israel represents God. Under the New Covenant, the church represents God. So 
there's not a lot of difference because when I talk of the nation of Israel, we're talking about the Old Covenant Church, aren't we? That's what we're talking about. So it's the church that represents God on earth and in the spirit realm for that matter. There's a teaching come out a few years ago about the courts of heaven. That teaching is as old as the Bible. It's just that someone's eyes were opened up to it. The courts of heaven have been there from day one. From day one. God's the judge of the courts of heaven. So that representation of the church can be a true one or a false one. For some reason, we all think in the church we are representing God correctly. That's true. We all think we are. In the early church, it came to me yesterday, the, 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 the first church meetings where Peter is assigned as the pastor or the apostle in that church and Ananias and Sapphira we know the story come into the church and Peter discerns by the Holy Spirit that there's a lying spirit on these two people he discerns it nobody tells him he discerns it we should all be discerning like that things mm. and as soon as Ananias walks in Peter challenges the spirit in him mm. he falls down dead and the Bible says that the fear of God came upon the whole community because of that. Now that is where the church is meant to be living at. Mm -hmm. Where the whole community of here, of Wellington, of Auckland, of, of America, wherever, each community is in total awe of this God. Mm -hmm. This one that sent his son to die for us today and do what we're thanking him for, that, that, that the world is so in awe of this God. Why? Because they see his almighty presence mm. in his church. And it brings a fear and an awe upon mankind. That is the way God designed the church to be. How close are we to it today? I don't need to ask that. So this message comes from my, my own experience in ministry more than once, more in more than one church, by the way, which caused me to seek the Lord at a deeper level. How the enemy can come in and literally destroy a church. I don't mean numerically because numbers mean nothing. You can have thousands of people can be destroyed, the church. How the enemy can literally come in and, and just rip apart everything God is doing. Mm -hmm. We can apply this to families. How the enemy can come in and just tear apart a family. Yet God has left this church, this family a long time ago. Despite the fact that the church is now building a new building worth millions of dollars. Despite the fact that hundreds of people are driving nice cars and got good jobs and live in beautiful homes. Despite the fact that you've got the greatest worship band in the area, God has left the church a long time ago. Mm. See, because we judge from a natural perspective. What we need to do is start discerning from a spiritual perspective what God is seeing. And that's where I'm going to lead this to today. Yeah. See, God's left that church, that ministry a long time ago. That church has become nothing more than a club. Nothing more than a club where members come and go. And yet, new people get initiated because they say, I do. And they become a member of the club and they fall into the same spiritual blindness of that club. And on the outward, that church would seem successful. In the world's eyes, that church is a successful church. But in heaven, it's a repugnant stench to God. Mm. Everything can look good on the outward. Mm. But in God's eyes, is a repugnant stench. God's only interested in this church now for one reason, and that is this. And someone prayed this this morning. He is looking for a man or a woman whose heart is pure, who is willing to confront the evil that has caused the destruction of that assembly. Yes. The Bible said in Ezekiel yeah. that, 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 that God looked for a man. He looked to and fro mm. for somebody, but he could find nobody. Mm. Can you imagine that? God couldn't find one person. 
I've thought about that many. I've cried over that verse many times, and I mean that. I'm not the same. How, how is it you can't find one person? One person? That should shake each one of us here today. God is looking for one person that can discern the truth, that is willing to pray into that thing, that is willing to go as a servant. When God says, go and speak for me, you speak for him, and you don't count your life worthy of anything. Mm. That's what he's looking for. That is the reason we came together as a group. I want to remind you that we did not come to play church. We come for a specific reason, was to lay down our life so we can say, yes, Lord, send me when you're ready, and I will prepare myself. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, was the verse we started with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you from the Bible today that it only takes one appointed overseer to commit a certain sin that will contaminate... The whole church. The whole church. One person can contaminate the whole church if he is a leader. If that person is not removed, it not only contaminates that church or that ministry, it now makes a mockery of what we have thanked the Lord for this morning. Mm -hmm. And that's the finished work of the cross. The sign this has happened will be the captivity of the people. The captivity. The, the church will be powerless. Powerless means that people are not getting delivered and set free. People are not getting healed. No matter how good the messages are that are getting preached, if people aren't getting set free, there is no power in the church. Mm -hmm. We've got to be honest about this. Whether we're sick or not ourselves, we must stand up and be honest. If the Word of God is not working, there is some reason why it's not working. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 to 14 speaks of the blessings of God are clearly not evident in this church. They pray for the sick, but the sick don't get healed. I was involved in the church, and I won't mention it, but every single meeting, rows of people come up the front for healing. Not one of them would ever be healed. Some would fall down on the ground and laugh. Some would fall down on the ground and cry, but not one would ever walk away set free and healed. Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong because when Jesus prayed for the sick, mm. they got healed. Mm -hmm. And the sign this has happened will be captivity is said in to the people. Gossip and infighting amongst the members is another sign. I don't know if you've been in a church where Sister So and so is backbiting this one. That, or, that will tell you that the enemy has already taken over the church. Mm -hmm. Deliberate sin is obvious in the members' life, yet they lack any urgency. The leadership lacks any urgency to correct the sin. I was in a church where multiple people were living together, living together, and been in the church for years, some of them, and the pastor wouldn't do nothing about it. Nothing. He said, oh, they'll leave. We'll let them leave. Th these are people that call themselves Christians, by the way. <laughs> and they did nothing about it. These are signs. Signs that the Lord has left the church. I personally have seen the devastating effects of evil altars that are signed against churches because either an elder, a deacon, a treasurer, a pastor has opened the door to the enemy. Sometimes through ignorance, and sometimes deliberately, but it makes no difference to God. God doesn't go, oh, the poor person, they're ignorant. No, mm. no, he doesn't do that. God, God lives by his laws, his spiritual laws. And this same principle works in a family where an evil covenant has been made from one of the parents. And that affects the whole household. I'm just going to take a little bit of a rabbit trail here because I had some thoughts on this this morning. Consider this. The Bible says, Samuel told Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I'm talking about families at the moment, not churches. When a child is continually rebelling against its parent, look to see if there is an altar of witchcraft that's been established. Look to see if there's an altar that's been established or a curse that is active on that child's life. How do we do that? Right. First, let's look for the sign of witchcraft. Number one, one of the parents is an ongoing rebellion themselves towards God. 
I told you we're going to go a little deep today, so if some stuff pricks here, because we're all parents, mm. just be willing to accept it. One of the parents, have a look, are they in rebellion to God? Number two, a covenant's been formed with the child at birth. Now, Emmy comes from a Catholic country where a child at birth is uh, initiated into the church, into the church. Maggie, I think you come from a country like that as well. That's a covenant that's been formed with that church then. Now you can go to God and say, forgive me for doing that, and that's great, and he forgives you, but it doesn't sever the covenant, meaning that covenant, that altar can speak into the life or the destiny of that child. This is something we have to deal with regularly at the orphanage. Regularly. Number three, the child has books or artifacts retaining to witchcraft or relating to witchcraft, i.e. Harry Potter is the latest thing. This stuff is evil and it's not good for our children. If it's in the male line, look at the father's bloodline. If it's in the female, look at the mother's bloodline. The problem with the child has been established already in the spirit realm. The problem is not the child acting out. The problem is already established in the spirit realm. Mm. The acting out is only the manifestation of what's already manifested first in the spirit realm. And where a parent usually goes wrong here is they try to correct the behavior rather than shutting down the source of the behavior. Now, it's just a rabbit trail, but it came to me this morning. When a child does not honor its parents, it invokes a self-imposed curse. I know in my own life this was a big issue. And the parent also needs to look at their own relationship with their own parent. For example, what is my relationship like with my mother, my father? Because if I'm in rebellion to my mother or father, if I don't honor them, then that then automatically goes upon my children also. Mm. Mm. Ephesians 6 verse 2, honor your mother and father as it's the first commandment with promise. Finally, in regards to this, a parent can curse their child by what they say. Jesus said in Matthew 18 verse 19, he said, I say that if two of you agree, it's touching anything. Mm -hmm. If they ask, it will be done for them mm -hmm. by my Father which is in heaven. Now, you can put the devil in this, this verse. If you agree with the devil, in other words, anything contrary to God's word about that child, you have then made a covenant or an agreement with the devil and cursed the child. Mm. Mm. Death and life are in the power of our tongue. We've got to watch what we say. We all miss it here. But look, it's not just a question of forgiveness because once these covenants have been enacted, we have to destroy the covenant. Mm -hmm. We have to destroy the altar. Asking God forgiveness is one part of it, but only one part of it. Anyway, moving right along, um, getting back to evil uh, uh, assignments against churches. An altar is a place always where a covenant is formed, always. And it's formed first and foremost in the spirit realm, in the spirit realm, not in the natural realm. It manifests in the natural realm after the spirit realm. For example, sex is a covenant. Okay, pornography is a covenant. Mm -hmm. Joining a lodge or a secret society is a covenant. Baptism into a church is a covenant when we get baptized at birth. Being an elder or pastor in the church is a covenant. These are all God. See, God, his whole word is about covenant. It's all about covenant. But covenants aren't always so covert. For example, covenants can be forged in your dreams. I won't go here today because I know when I presented this last time, I got some resistance. I can sense it in the spirit realm. I will go here one time, though, and talk about dreams because we need to wake up and realize that you are a spirit being and your spirit never sleeps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember the scripture, whilst men slept, the enemy came in and so it is. Ignorance is maintained in many churches because of these type of teachings are never brought over the pulpit. So people remain ignorant. And if you don't know how your enemy works, he's already got you beaten. Sadly, many church leaders, deacons, elders, etc., knowingly or unknowingly, have made covenants 
have made covenants with the enemy and fallen into idolatry, which I intend to show you today. I am not bashing leaders. I am not bashing the church. I have been here myself, so I'm speaking from experience. There's one sin throughout the pages of God's word that will cause God to hand us over to our enemy, and that is idolatry. We like to think when we get saved that we're foolproof, and we're not. Mm -hmm. Idolatry will always cause you to be handed over to the enemy. Most believers will dismiss that word and they say that's something out of the old covenant. We don't worship idols anymore. And, and so they just dismiss it as something that used to happen. But I want to tell you today, there is more idolatry in the church today than there was in the old covenant. More. More. Judges chapter 6, verse 1 to to, to, to verse 8. I think we need to read this. <laughs> Judges chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 8. And Israel, let's replace the word Israel with the word church because Israel was the church of the day. And the church did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's verse 1. See, it's so easy to think of Israel as a nation of people and of that bad people. The church is not like that. No, we're talking about the church here. Mm. The church did evil in the sight of the Lord. How is it the whole nation or the whole church can do evil in God's sight? Because, actually, I won't even read this. You read it yourself for the sake of time. But what happens here is you probably know the story. Gideon is called by God to go and sort out a problem that his father has started. And it's worshipping idols. And so God starts off by saying, and Israel and the church did evil in the sight of God. So God charges the whole church, the whole nation of Israel for this evil. But if you read the story, you'll find that only Gideon's father and a few of his helpers were worshipping at that idol. Mm. All of Israel wasn't worshipping it. Some of them might, but very few of them were. And yet God charged them all with the sin. And someone might say, well... That was different because God judged Israel as a nation. But he doesn't judge the church today that way. And I'd say to you, well, you're correct. God judged Israel as a nation, as a collective of people rather than an individual. However, God does and will always judge his church because he is covenanted to it. Mm. This is what this whole thing was about, that that. Israel, because of their leader, the covenant made by God to protect them, to bless them, to do all the things that, that, that Jesus came in our time to, to, to give us. Everything that was there for them was, was for them to live. But when the covenant was broken, it no longer became their right to inherit <laughs> healing, to, their right to inherit the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. Quite the contrary happened. And all of them got charged because of this one man's sin. He was a leader. How many churches have you sat in without recognizing that this leader, if he's not right with God, I could be contaminated by him? Look, to be honest, I went for years without thinking that thought. Just, you rock up to the church, you, you know, you elevate the pastor, you think, well, he looks like a good guy, looks like he's got it together, drives a good car, nice home, good family, but you don't know that he's in the Masonic Lodge. Mm -hmm. You don't know that he's covenanted to another woman. You don't know the things that he's done in his personal life. Mm -hmm. And you've put yourself under the spiritual covering of, covering of that leader. So it, this, this issue with Israel here is the same as a pastor, elder, deacon or treasurer or something. is practicing idolatry. Then because that person holds an agreed position of authority as an overseer, God will see the congregation suffer for it. I have been in a number of churches. And I won't say too much, but one of them was a church that I pioneered where this very issue was the case, where one of the leadership had covenanted 
with the enemy. Knowingly or unknowingly is irrelevant. And the effects of that were devastating on the church. Mm. So bear in mind, Gideon's father is the leader of Israel, a leader of the church at the time, if you like. Israel has been charged with the sin of idolatry, and all of them now are going to pay. And that seems so unfair. That's, that's unfair, God. How can the children pay for that person's sin? It's not fair. That's the way our rational, emotional, mm. human nature thinks. Why should Sister Val pay for the pastor's sin? Well, from generation, sorry, from Genesis to Revelation, wherever God got angry with his people, he hands them over to the enemy. It was always because of idolatry. The problem today is the church has little or no understanding what idolatry is. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. We all think it's about sitting down and worshipping some statue. That's what we think it is. Well, I'm going to show you what Paul said idolatry is. When Achan, a soldier of Israel army, was caught with pilfering stuff out of Jericho, remember, God told him to go in and march around Jericho how many times and the walls will collapse down and you go and take the city, remember that? And Achan, mm -hmm. one of the soldiers, God said, touch nothing because the whole nation of Jericho is cursed. Why? Because they worshipped other idols. Don't take nothing from them. Destroy everything. Achan decides that he likes the gold and the silver and pillages some of it and hides it under his bed. And God finds out. And he charges the nation with Achan's sin. What happens? The story, we all know. Achan gets killed. Mm. He's killed. He's slaughtered. He has to. They have to get rid of... Of the problem, in all, it doesn't mean go and kill someone in a church, by the way, but they, God had to get rid of the problem, the sin, mm -hmm. in order for the blessing to come back. Mm -hmm. on the, it, now, you, you say, yeah, I understand all this stuff. We're going to go very deep in a minute. I'm laying the foundation. It's not going to be much longer. So nobody knew anything. Only Achan knew this, right? Mm -hmm. And consequently, all of Israel's curse. Proverbs 3, verse 33 says this. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. Is in the, you say, I'm not wicked. We need to judge ourselves by how God sees us. When we worship idols, we're wicked in his eyes. I'm going to get to what idols are in a minute. We see in the early church, Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, he discerns that lying spirit. See, God doesn't want the stuff in his church. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want it in the church. Jesus didn't give his life. For a church that does not represent him correctly. The old covenant church had misrepresented God so often. Why would those who don't know God, like our neighbours, why would they want to know God by the way the church is living today? Amen. You ask one of your unsafe friends, do you see anything different with the church and those of the world? Most of us say, no, I don't see any different. I see brother so-and-so down the pub at night getting drunk. Or I see that guy yelling at his wife. Or I saw him beating his children up. Mm. That's how the world judges us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Why would they want to know God? See, the church is his representation. The church is meant to be the draw card, the flashing lights to the world. Hey, we've got what you need. And people come running to it. That's what revival is. But see, that is not going to happen. Although the church is telling you it's going to happen, it's not going to happen until the church cleans up its act. Mm -hmm. It cannot happen. Mm -hmm. If the prophet Ezekiel, his cry was, I look for a man. Mm -hmm. I look for a man who would stand in the gap. But I could not find, not one, hmm? not one. So what is an idol today? Okay, here we go. Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to verse 6, Put to death what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, that means impure thoughts, evil desires, and covetousness. Covetousness means the lust for something or someone, right? Which is idolatry. Which is idolatry. I've quoted you the Barner Institute research facts that there is over 60% of pastors are hooked on pornography. That tells me there's over 60% of pastors that are in sexual immorality or impurity, which is idolatry.
This is not preached in most churches. This is idolatry. Why? Because that person is worshipping the creature rather than the creator. That's what idolatry is. So idolatry today is any of these mentioned and pure thoughts, sexual immorality, evil desires, covetousness. I personally have been involved in idolatry. I don't know about you. <laughs> huh? I think we all have. Eh? Huh? Yeah, we, we all have. Mm -hmm. And God hates idolatry. Mm -hmm. He hates it. Nothing can be more dangerous than the wrath of a righteous God and a holy God. And Paul says the wrath of God is coming on idolatry. Now that's what the church has got to look forward to. I hate to be the, bring, the, the, the bringer of sad tidings. That is what the church has got to look forward to. The wrath of God is coming on idolatry. We talk of God's grace and mercy as love, and that's true. But what if it's wrath that is coming on idolatry? Exodus 20 says this, You shall not bow down, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, are a jealous God. Mm -hmm. Jealous God. So, so the wrath of God comes on the idolaters because God is jealous. That is the reason God hates idolatry more than anything in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because he's a jealous God. He, more so now that he's given his son. We think in the new covenant, God's backed off of it. You know, he's awesome. No, I would say God is more jealous now than ever before because he's actually paid a, a greater price now by sending his son. And then the Holy Spirit. Oh, and the Holy Spirit. So can imagine now that God is, is trying to protect his name and here we've got pastors that are sitting down to their computers every night looking at porn or, or coveting something or wanting a greater, bigger salary or whatever that is and it becomes idolatry in their life. Mm -hmm. And if we desire to put other things in the place that satisfy us more than God and his word to us, then we not only offend or anger God, but we also destroy ourselves in that place. By far the most important passage of all verses in the Bible is this, that examines the intimate correlation or connection between idolatry and sexual sin. And it's this Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 32. We won't read it now for the sake of time, but Romans 1, verse 25 says this, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worship and serve the creature, that's man or a woman, that's what sexual sin is. A worship of the creature, mm. that's idolatry. Mm. I counted eight times in scripture where there's a link between idolatry and sexual sin. Five of them in the new covenant. Five of them in the New Covenant. Sexual sin is not the core problem, by the way. Idolatry is the core problem. It's the root core of all sexual sin, be it pornography or the act itself. It starts first in the spirit realm. Mm. It's not a question of I walked down the mall and I just happened to bump into some gorgeous woman and I fell for her. No, 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 no. It started way back here where my mind has already been dwelling on this stuff. That's why Jesus said that, that lust, Lust is the same as the act of adultery. The more we think on this stuff, because we're already putting those thoughts, raising them up to the high places, as it were. Mm. Amen. It's the worship of the creature. Mm. In Israel, the church, sin was spiritual adultery. Now, in Judges chapter 6, very quickly, God says he, he gave Israel, or gave the church, over to the hands of their enemy. Mm. Notice that word, and God gave. In Judges chapter 4, it says, and God sold them. Mm. Sold them. Into the hands of their enemies. In Samuel chapter 1, it says, and God sold them into the hands of their enemies. Now, think about those words, gave and sold. What do they mean? Well, we know if, if, if I sell my car, it's no longer my car. Mm. It's really simple. We don't have to try and reinterpret that. If I sell this house, it's no longer my house. If I give those chocolates to our brother Eddie and say, mm -hmm. they're all yours, brother. They're no longer mine to have any. It means I no longer are the, the, the rightful owner of that. Why? Mm -hmm. Because God has given. Okay, you want that? 
that I no longer can protect you. I no longer can do what Jesus come for, for you. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter how many times you cry out, God, help us, and keep praying for your, your, your sickness or your disease or whatever. God cannot do anything because he's already given that person over. He doesn't have a legal right anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In other words... That person no longer belongs to me. You mean to say they're not a Christian? I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not God. It's not my place to say that. What I'm saying is that God has said, right, you want that? Right, you go there. But I can no longer help you legally. No matter how much you cry out to me, I cannot do nothing about it. Mm-hmm. In Judges chapter 10, verse 1 to 18, we'll read for the second time once again. Up until verse 5, Israel's doing great. They've got back right with God. This is between chapter 6 and chapter 10. They're doing awesome. And then chapter 7, I think it is, Israel now falls into the worshipping of idols yet again. And everything goes bad for them. And because of this, God hands them over to their enemies to be tormented for 18 years. Mm -hmm. By the way, that number 18 is the number of oppression. I don't know if you knew that. Remember, this woman was bound for 18 years with a spirit of infirmity. Jesus cast that spirit. 18 is the number of oppression. So God hands them over for a set period of time to be oppressed to the enemy. See, the church doesn't want to hear this. They want to hear about God's good. Yes, God is good. But man is not. And if we read, this is where I'm going to wrap this up. And this is where the big punchline comes that you need to take away and seek the Lord over. In Ezekiel chapter 9, I spent nearly 40 hours on this this week, on this one chapter. When I bring a message to you, I said to Emmy last night, nobody will know other than God the amount of time I spend bringing the message. I don't just sit down and, and, and prattle something off that's on the internet. This message alone I spent over 60 hours on this week. You say, well, you're pretty dumb. You obviously don't get it very quick. No, no, no. I, I, I just keep researching and researching. If I get one scripture, I'll research it through different parts of the Bible to try and understand the context, everything else about it. Ezekiel chapter 9. We're going to see there how God punishes Israel. I'm going to show you today something that you've probably never seen in the church before. How God, the almighty creator of heaven and earth, punishes Israel. His church. Mm. How he does it. I'm not talking about in the natural. That's obvious. I'm talking about in the spiritual. How he does it. Ezekiel 9 gives us insight into the spirit realm. So we can see how God works. We can see how God thinks. When it comes to his people involved in idolatry. And all we see with our natural eyes. Is only the consequence of that idolatry. All we see happening when we read those horrific stories in Revelation of what's going to come upon the earth. All that is, is the manifestation of something that has happened a long time ago in the spirit realm. So God is going to give us a look into the spirit realm here. Where we can peel back the curtains and actually visibly see how he functions in the spirit realm. Chapter 8 of Ezekiel, I'll just give you a quick brief on it because I'm going to wrap this up. The prophet Ezekiel is sitting in his own house and he's got the elders of the church there sitting with him. They're probably having a meal. They're having a discussion. And the Bible tells us in chapter 8 that all of a sudden Ezekiel is caught up in the spirit. In other words, Ezekiel is having, like I'm having lunch with you and I'm sitting there But my spirit man is gone. I'm out of there. I'm having a vision now. And God calls up Ezekiel to show him what is going to happen to these idolaters, to these ones that have worshipped idols. And he takes Ezekiel in chapter 8 up into Jerusalem, into the city of Jerusalem, and he brings him down in the vision into the temple. This is all in the spirit realm, all right? This is not something that's manifesting in the natural. This is in the spirit realm. So Ezekiel is with the Lord and he comes down into the temple in Jerusalem. 
and god is going to show him what's happening behind the scenes in secret in the temple in other words what's happening in secret in the church what the leaders are actually doing in secret god is going to reveal to ezekiel this is not in the natural please understand this is in the spirit ezekiel is seeing this we automatically think that back then when the church did evil things those don't happen today i'm telling you they do happen today but the opposite is the truth it's happening now and it's possibly happening even more the problem is we have not seen it like ezekiel saw it mm -hmm. this is why we need the spirit of discernment operating so much in this hour we need to discern what is happening with people spiritually now keep in mind ezekiel's prophetic vision has yet to take place in the natural. In other words, what Ezekiel is going to see has not manifested at this time. But he's getting a preview. It's a bit like going to the movies. You get a preview of an up-and-coming event. That's what's happening here with Ezekiel. So Ezekiel is getting this preview. Remember, everything happens first in the spirit realm before it manifests into the natural realm. Ezekiel chapter 9, God summons his warring angels who watch over Jerusalem, and he instructs them what to do. And if you will bear with me, I would like to read this to you, because I think this is so relevant to each one of us in our walk at the moment with the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. If anyone's there, please, you can start reading it right from verse 1. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. Okay, can I stop you there for a minute, Mike? Forgive me for interrupting, but just so everybody's understanding this picture. God has called six, I think the number is angels. These are angels. Mm -hmm. Summon six angels. Mm -hmm. Six warring angels. One of them has an inkhorn. In other words, one of them's got a pen. I'm going to make it in, in English colloquial. One of them's got a pen, and he's wearing fine linen. So he's obviously the leader of this group of angels. Please continue, Mike. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So stop there, Mike. So, so what, what's happened here is God has summoned this, this great angel who's got this inkhorn or this pen, and he's saying, your job, your assignment is to go and mark out those in the city who have obeyed me. Mm. This is in the church we're talking about, okay? Go and mark, put a mark on the forehead of those that have obeyed me. Now think about this because this is going to start to, to, to bring up some thoughts in your mind about what's going to happen at the end of days. Carry on, Mike. To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Stop there, Mike. Now, here we come. Judgment begins in the house of God. Mm -hmm. This is where that scripture comes from. Mm -hmm. God is going to judge his house. He is judging his house now. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a horrifying scene. Mm -hmm. Think about it. How can a loving God slaughter? 
children, elderly, innocent. How can he do this? But you see, that's our human emotion speaking because God knows the beginning from the end, the Bible says. He sees the end of that child's life from the beginning of its life. He is the almighty God. He knows what's going to happen here. So he has to get rid of this contamination. And the mark of God is given throughout Scripture Oftentimes, oftentimes, and Lot in Sodom, there was a mark put on them. Israel coming out of Egypt, remember, there was a mark put upon them. Rahab at Jericho, there was a mark put upon it. In Revelation 144,000, there is a mark. There are angels assigned by heaven, by God, in this hour that are going around right now, putting a mark on the foreheads of those remnant that God is pleased with. That have obeyed God. Please carry on, Mike. So the Lord said, Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone, and I fell on my face and cried out and said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? That's the sort of thing I'd say. That's that's human emotion. That's that, exactly what I'd say. God, surely not everybody. Come on. This what Ezekiel. This is Ezekiel's emotion coming out. Now, God, you're going to kill them all. You're going to. But you see, Ezekiel now is in his emotion rather than in the spirit. God has taken him up in the spirit. It means he's actually spiritually alert. And then he gets back over in the flesh here. And he starts to try and rationalize this and understand. If he stayed in the spirit, he'd realize this. God had already said, put a mark mm -hmm. on those that have obeyed. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel would have known by that that God is caring for his own. Yeah. See, when we talk about the church, we've got everyone saved, are they? Everyone here has said, I receive Christ, have they? Only God knows that. We don't know that. That's the purpose of this angel. Sorry, continue, Mike. Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say... The Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. And as for me also, my eye will neither spare, nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then, the men clothed with linen, who had the, the man clothed with linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back and said, "I have done as you commanded me." Wow. Mm -hmm. You see how an angel operates? Mm. There's no emotion here. He does what he's told. And he's reported back here and he said, I've obeyed you. Mm. It's done. Ezekiel here has got a little encouragement in this last verse, verse 11, because not all of Judah is going to be destroyed. Not all of the church is going to be destroyed. The report is in. The man with the pen has done his work. Just a little rabbit trail before I close. We all know that there's coming a time that there's going to be a mark placed upon the forehead of mankind and upon their hand. I want to submit to you today something to go and think about. That mark is a spiritual mark. Mm -hmm. We've been taught over the years in the church that it's a whatever, microchip or whatever. But I want to defunct that belief very quickly. It's already old school technology that thought that someone would have a microchip placed in them. As a matter of fact, on the TV last week, there's a guy here in Wellington, New Zealand, who has already got it in his hand, and that's his, got all his information. He goes up to the ATM and just goes like that. It's, oh, in England already, there is a large, large mall where... That's how that mall functions. It has that technology already. We're beyond it. Where a person's iris or their finger mm. is sufficient to give all the data. So that, that, that belief that we were taught, and I understand why the old prophetic people taught that, because that's what they saw in the natural realm. They believed that's what would happen. This is a spiritual mark, mm. and it's put there by an angel. I don't have all the answers here, but I wonder if the mark 
is the fact that the person doesn't have the mark of God on their forehead. You mean Something to think about. The angel's job was to mark those who were right with God. Mm. Father God, that's our prayer today. Mm. That we be right with you. Mm. That we are in right standing with you. That we have no ego. We don't, we don't have any false belief that we are perfect when we're not, Lord. Lord, prepare mm. us. Do everything. Yes. Come. Do the, whatever needs to happen in our mm. life, Lord. That mm. we are ready. That we hold the mark of God. Amen. Because when the time comes, Lord, We've seen already your fury. We've seen what you do. We've had a spiritual insight into the spirit realm. Because later on, some time later, we see this thing that you did with Israel manifesting in the natural. Mm -hmm. Where the enemies come in and literally destroy the city. So, Lord, you've given us insight for a reason. The Bible is given to us to learn from for a reason. Prepare us, Lord. Shake us. Speak to us in our dreams. Do whatever's necessary, Lord, that we may wear the mark of God on our forehead. Yes, yes, yes. In Jesus' name. Just before we finish, I want to say, this is, this is a personal belief. The mark, there's two marks given in the, in the book of Revelation. One is on the head, the forehead, the other is on the hand. I believe it works like this. The person who has the mark on their forehead is the person that has flat out refused God, denied God. Because the forehead is the seat of the mind. That's where you think. You have totally rejected God. Nothing to The mark on the hand, however, I believe, is people who believe in God. Mm. but are not right with them. And I think that's the difference. I could spend a whole hour talking on this, <laughs> but I won't. But there's some deep stuff to think about here, because this is the hour we're living in now. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's right. This is the hour we're living in. And holiness has got to come back into the church. Mm. I don't want to be involved in anything that doesn't live in holiness. Mm. So I encourage you to take what I've said today in love. Don't allow your human mind to understand God. Mm. Allow the Word of God to speak for itself. Mm. That's a, an amazing... Chapter 8, Chapter 9 of Ezekiel is, is a good read. It's well worth reading to remind us of who this majestic God is mm. and how he Mm. God bless you.